All right, let me open us up. Let me open us up in prayer. Can we do that? Let's open up in prayer. And then we're going to be looking at the fourth century today. Well, let's ask God's help in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the privilege of getting to study church history this morning together. Father, build us up and encourage and spur us on as we see examples of those whom you have strengthened by your spirit and the display of how Christ is fulfilling his promise to conquer the nations and to bring the nations into him. Father, make us glad in Christ this morning as we look at these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Children, who can tell me what is church history? I know you've been asked that question before. Can anybody give me an answer? What is church history? Yes, Brighton? The church. We're looking at the church in church history. That's true. Church history is the story of how Jesus has built his church for his own glory and his people's good. You remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18? Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So children, why should you and I study church history then? Why is it good for us to look at church history this morning and to listen and to hear about what God did during the fourth century? Why should we study church history? Anybody want to try to answer that? It teaches us. What did you say? For instruction. We study church history because we need to learn about Jesus conquering the nations through his gospel. This is what Revelation chapter 6 verse 2 tells us. That Jesus came out conquering and to conquer. And as we study church history, we get to see the fulfillment of how Jesus is doing that in every single age of his church. In the first century in the second century, in the third century, in the fourth century. And it helps us understand how Jesus is still doing that today. Do you remember what you learned last time you were together about the third century? You remember what was happening to the church? Was everybody being kind and nice to them and giving them nice things? Is that what was happening? No. That's right. The church was suffering because they wanted to live holy lives and those who hated the Lord did not like that. Do you remember the modalists? Do you remember the false teachers during the third century and what they taught? How they were saying that God doesn't really eternally exist in three persons, but God just has these different masks that he changes And sometimes it looks like he's the father and sometimes it looks like he's the son and sometimes it looks like he's the Holy Spirit. But is that what the Bible teaches? No. No. Do you remember how Tertullian, how he stood up and he made a defense for what the Bible teaches about the Trinity, that God has eternally existed, one God in three persons, the father, son, and spirit. Children, can any of you tell me what your memory verse was these last two weeks? Does anybody know their memory verse and would like to stand up and try to recite it? You want to stand up and say it? Always be prepared to make a defense. defense. Excellent job. Would you like to try to? Go for it. Always be prepared to make a defense. defense. Good job, girl. That's what 1 Peter 3.15 teaches us. What about your memory quote? Can anybody tell me your memory quote from last time? That's right. Does anybody remember who said that? Tertullian. We worship unity in Trinity and Trinity in unity. So this week, we're going to be looking at the fourth century 
And did the fourth century come before or after the third century that you listened to last week? It comes afterwards. So this is what's happening after the things you learned about last week as Jesus is continuing to conquer the nations with his gospel. And during the fourth century, so this is the years 300 through 400, we see the church still standing firm as they're enduring the worst persecution up to this point in time. We see the church standing firm under intense persecution. And we also get to see a man named Athanasius who stands firm against the entire Roman government. We get to learn about the church standing firm in the fourth century. Listen to what 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15 says. This is Paul, the apostle, writing to the church in Thessalonica, but he's writing to the church in all ages. So these words were written to strengthen the church in the fourth century, and these words were written for you and I to learn from. These are commands from the Lord Jesus to us all. He says, So then, brothers, stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. And he's saying, these things we've told you and these things we've written down in our letters, the letters that you and I have in our Bible. He says, stand firm in them. And even when false teachers come and they say things contrary to what we've written to you, you stand firm no matter what. And this is exactly what we see the church doing in the fourth century. So the first thing we're going to look at is how the church stood firm under intense persecution. This is what makes up the first 12 years of the fourth century. An emperor, the emperor Diocletian. Children, can you say Diocletian? The emperor Diocletian comes to power at the very beginning of the fourth century. And he hates the Christians. And he puts the Christians through persecution unlike anything the church has experienced up to this point. Diocletian issues four edicts at the very beginning of the fourth century. The first thing that he commands and writes into law is that Christian church buildings, wherever they are found, are to be destroyed. Children, can you point to a Christian church building? Can you point to a building where the church gathers to worship Jesus? We are sitting in one right now. In Diocletian, if we were alive during the fourth century, he's saying this building, someone needs to come and burn it to the ground. That was the first law that he put into place. The second one is that all copies of the Bible were to be found and burned. Children, raise your hand if you own a copy of the Bible. Diocletian is saying, find their Bibles and burn them so that the Christians cannot have Bibles anymore. The third thing, the third edict that Diocletian put into law at the beginning of the fourth century was that all Christians were to be deprived of public office and civil rights. He was saying if your parents work for the government, they would be fired. And that you, if you trust in Jesus, were not to be protected by the laws that protect everyone else. But if people wanted to come and do harmful things to you or even to kill you, The laws would not protect you. And people could do whatever they wanted to Christians. And the government would not do anything to protect them. The fourth thing that Diocletian put into law. Was that all without exception. Were to sacrifice to the false gods. Upon pain of death. If the Christians would not offer sacrifices to the false demon gods they would kill them. Now, children, what do you think the church does during the fourth century 
when Diocletian puts all of these laws into practice. What do you think the church did? Do you think they shrugged their shoulders and said, oh, well, I guess we have to obey the emperor and worship false gods. You think that's what the church did? No. The church stood firm, just as the apostle Paul had commanded them. They stood firm, loving not their own lives, even unto death. And very many of them were carried off to death. This is how the fourth century began. The church was intensely persecuted for 11 years until a new emperor came to power. That emperor's name was Constantine. Can you say Constantine? Constantine. Constantine. Now, Constantine didn't always do the right thing. In fact, he did lots of things that were bad. But the Lord put it into the emperor Constantine's heart to pity the Christians. And when Constantine came to power after Diocletian, he removed all of the laws that stood against the Christians. No longer could their buildings be burned down. No longer could their Bibles be burned. No longer were they outside of the laws, but Constantine made it so that Christians were protected by law again. And the Christians experienced relief because God was gracious to them. We see that happening in the fourth century. And we see the Christians continue to be protected by laws, even hereafter. The church would suffer new things, as now everybody wanted to be a Christian since the emperor was protecting and giving the Christians special privileges. Now even people that didn't trust in Jesus wanted to come into the church. And so we see as a result that false teaching abounds. And the Christians have a new challenge to guard and to stand firm against false teaching, even though now they're not persecuted by the government. This is what we see in the first century, the church standing firm under persecution. Here's the second thing that I want you to know about from the fourth century. There is a man named Athanasius. Can you say Athanasius? Athanasius. Athanasius stood firm against the entire Roman Empire. During the fourth century, there was a man named Arius. Children, can you say Arius? Arius Arius was from Alexandria in Africa. And Arius was going around teaching people that Jesus was not truly God as the Father is. Is his teaching good? Or is he teaching falsely? He's teaching falsely. He was telling people that there was a time when the son was not. That Jesus is a created being just like you and I are. And that he was not truly God like the father is. And so he's going around and he's teaching this falsely. And sadly, many people heard his teaching and they believed him. And the church was becoming divided over Arius' teaching because he was an effective teacher that people listened to. So in the year A.D. 325, the emperor Constantine decided to hold a council. And he invited pastors from all over the world to come gather together and to decide the issue whether or not the Bible teaches that Jesus was created, or if the Bible teaches that Jesus is the eternal son of God. And so these pastors, for the first time, traveled safely across the Roman Empire without worrying about being captured and thrown into prison or being killed along the way. But they got to travel safely and hold this council with pastors from all over the world And do you know what these pastors decided? They put out a statement so that the whole church could know what Arius was teaching was false. That the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus is the eternal son of God. He is truly God from God, the second person in the Trinity. And he has always existed just like God the father. 
And in this statement, they charged Arius to never teach this false doctrine again. And they put Arius outside of the church. Do you think Arius stopped teaching falsely after this? He did not. Arius continued to go around and teach people falsely, telling them lies about Jesus. But Arius, he didn't want to stop teaching falsely, but he did want to come back into the church. So Arius went to the emperor Constantine and he asked Constantine if he could be readmitted to the church. And what do you think Constantine's going to say? Constantine said, yes, you may come back into the church. And so without requiring Arius to stop teaching falsely, the emperor Constantine wrote a letter to the pastor in Alexandria commanding him to let Arius back into the church so that Arius could continue to teach the people falsely. Do you know who the pastor in Alexandria was? It was a man named Athanasius. And what do you think Athanasius said when the emperor of the known world commanded him to let Arius back into the church? Yes. Athanasius said no. Athanasius stood firm even when the emperor would not. And Athanasius said, I will not allow this false teaching about my Lord to let let it go freely in this empire. And so Constantine kicked Athanasius out of the church. Athanasius stood firm, sticking to what was written in the scriptures. And as a result, he was put out of the church. Not once, not twice, not three times, not four times, But five times over the course of his life, every time the emperor would change, Athanasius would be invited back to be the pastor in Alexandria. And when they discovered that Athanasius would stand firm and he wouldn't teach the people what the people wanted to hear, but he would only teach what the Bible said was true, they would put him out of the church again. The church in Athanasius' day had a saying about him. In Latin, they would say, Athanasius contra mundum. Who speaks Latin in the room? Mamas, do any of you know what Athanasius contra mundum means? Can anybody guess? Athanasius against the world. The church looked on and they saw this single little man standing up to the Roman Empire and refusing to teach against the scriptures no matter who commanded him to. And the church grew bold to stand firm as well, sticking to what the apostles had once for all laid to be the foundation of the church. The church grew bold looking to Athanasius and they would say, Athanasius against the world. Look at this one man who refuses to bend his knee to the Roman Empire, even when they command him to do what is false. Interestingly, Athanasius is also the one who has given us the earliest record of all 66 books of the Bible. If you remember the letters that were written by the apostles, were written at different times in different parts of the world even. And these letters were sent to churches in different places. And until the fourth century, the church has been intensely persecuted. So the church couldn't get together and they couldn't talk in peace and discuss what letters had been received. There were some parts of the church that didn't even know about all of the letters that the apostles had written. But in the fourth century, when it was safe for them to get together and for them to hold counsel like these, for the first time, the church was able to come together and actually write out a list articulating which books of the Bible were truly, what letters from the apostles were truly the word of God breathed out and inspired by him. 
And Athanasius is the oldest record that we have. I'm sure there were earlier ones, but it's the earliest one that we have preserved where he had all 66 books of the Bible, the 66 books that you have in your Bible written down on a piece of paper. We see in the fourth century, the church not creating the Bible and not deciding what books should go into the Bible, but recognizing what the Holy Spirit reveals to you and I, what books he himself has inspired. And those 66 books that the pastors, when they got together and said, this is the word of God, those are the very same books you and I still have in our Bibles today. Because God was revealing to the church in all generations what books he himself had breathed out by his spirit. Now, children, are you ready to learn a new memory verse? Here's your memory verse that I want you to memorize over these next two weeks. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. And 2 Thessalonians 2.15 says this. Stand firm. And hold to the traditions that you were taught by us. You want to practice saying that with me? I'll say it and I'll break it up. And will you children repeat after me? 2 Thessalonians 2.15. 2 Thessalonians 2.15. Stand firm. Stand firm. And hold to the traditions, to the traditions. that you were taught by us. And for your memory quote this week, I want you to learn Latin. You ready to learn some Latin this week? Three words, Athanasius contra mundum. And does anybody remember what that means? Athanasius against the world. As you learn your memory quote, remember that Athanasius was just one single Christian like you and I are who was strengthened by the Holy Spirit to stand firm. And you can look at Athanasius' example and see even how the whole church was encouraged by his example standing firm. And with the help of the same Holy Spirit, we can do the same. Standing firm on what Jesus Christ himself has commanded us in the scriptures. All right, pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for these things that have been written down and that we can see and remember how Jesus Christ was continuing to conquer the nations in the fourth century. Help us to stand firm like Athanasius did. Strengthen us by your spirit to tolerate no false teaching about our Lord. But Father, fill us with such love for him that we would be ready to even stand alone in all the world if that is what is required of us. We ask you to do this for your own glory and for the glory of your son. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen.